the oh, dramatic yeah. rises across southern England. Uh, 70% third strain Nigeria. number of secondary infections produced by one person. Well, what's interesting is I haven't been able to go out and see if well above one across the country and it's UK and South Africa in have the same uh, five wild mutation, say, which is from mink. Uh, but the, last, the UK uh, is from mink. What is South Africa uh, from? It is and what is Nigeria is from? Um, although the death rate Keesh is about virus half that of what we saw back in April, um, for various reasons, um, better treatment, uh, probably more uh, uh, susceptible people, less exposed. But the big worry is the Christmas super spreader events, in other words. Well, I was going to ask you that, yeah. because we're now, what, four days on from Christmas Day. Um, <clears throat> it was shut down you know, quite significantly from the five days in the UK that uh, the Prime Minister said you can kind of mix with up to three households for five days. It shrunk to one day, but one day will still have an impact, one would have thought. So when might we see the fruits of that, if, it, if that is the right word? Well, that's a good question, and we don't know for certain. I mean, the Thanksgiving <coughs> festival in, in, in the United States led to a significant spike. If we're going to see the effects of that, we'll start to see cases uh, continue to rise in the n next few days, hospitalizations in a week or so, and or during the next week, and then deaths after that. Uh, but the, pro the big problem is that increased transmission will make it much more difficult to get R below one. We're not in a national lockdown. We're in so-called tier four in the southern part of the country uh, and only tier three in many other parts of the country. And we know uh, Chris Whitty, our chief medical officer, said, you know, three months ago that tier three is not enough to control the infection. So I think, you know, there are some difficult questions ahead for the government uh, and do you think that that, that that difficult question is, um, <clears throat> what are you going to do about further restrictions? Are you saying now, with this new variant we know of in this country, and, as you say, the viral load seems to be greater, the spread seems to be faster, that, that a national lockdown is the only sensible thing to do? Well, in independent stage, we're calling for Tier 4 across the whole country uh, at the moment, and to consider... A, a full lockdown in the very near future because uh, at the okay. moment... And Tier 4, just for people open. who don't understand that uh, that un understand that term, what does that mean? Well, Tier 4 means that you cannot join or form what's called a Christmas bubble. You mustn't leave your home except for specific purposes. All retail shops are closed apart from essential ones, uh, you know, gyms, hotels and the like. So it's, it's very close to a national lockdown, but education would remain open. And, of course, for things like weddings and funerals and stuff. But um, we, we believe the whole country should be in that right now, given the severity but there, you know, there are good news stories around at the moment as well, in the sense that we do have safe vaccines and, okay, and they and are they, effective uh, vaccines. And they're being rolled out. We thank you for your time. Thank you so much for joining us on Newsday, Dr. Anthony Costello, their Professor of Global Health and Sustainable Development at University College. The bill would have resulted in the government shutting down from midnight on Monday. A Chinese citizen journalist who reported on the early days of the coronavirus outbreak in the city of Wuhan has been sentenced to four years in jail. Zhang Jian, a former lawyer, was convicted of provoking trouble. The U.S. Embassy in Beijing has urged the Chinese authorities to immediately release 12 Hong Kong pro-democracy activists arrested in August while trying to flee the territory in a speedboat. In a statement, the U.S. Embassy said that the group's only crime was to attempt to escape tyranny. The charity Christian Aid has been counting the human and economic costs of extreme events in 2020. They say floods in China and India caused damage amounting to more than $40 billion, while hurricanes and wildfires in the United States were to blame for tens of billions more losses. A Russian fishing trawler has sunk in the Arctic waters of the Barents Sea, leaving 17 people missing. The Russian emergency services say they were able to rescue just two members of the Onyega's crew before the weight of accumulated ice sank the vessel. 
Johnny Muller, a star of the first Australian cricket tour of England, the Aboriginal team of 1868, has been inducted into the country's Cricket Hall of Fame, despite never having played for the nation. The panel said it wanted to acknowledge the contribution made by Indigenous players. BBC News. Thank you for the latest news update. Hello, welcome. You're listening to Newsday on the BBC World Service. Lawrence Pollard and Claire McDonnell with you. Welcome to the programme. Wherever you're listening today, we're going to take you to South Africa, Burkina Faso and Ethiopia over the next half hour. Sports news too. James Gregg will be telling us about the Boxing Day games in the Premier League, uh, amongst other things, and a befitting end to 2020 as New York celebrates Good Riddance Day. The tradition involves writing down your least favourite memory of the year on a piece of paper and then they will shred it for you in a confetti-like ticker tape parade in Times Square. COVID, of course, a strong contender there, you might think. Uh, and as the pandemic, a pandemic, of course, is far from over the event, uh, as so many others this year, is going to be held digitally. You can actually get involved in that. We'll tell you how. Stay tuned. This is Newsday. Let's talk about the virus in South Africa, which is already the worst hit country in Africa. It's now become the first country on the continent to register more than a million COVID-19 cases. Uh, it comes just days after it was confirmed that there is a new uh, variant uh, detected in South Africa, that is sort of similar in the way that it operates, it seems, of the one that's been detected in England as well. Some hospitals and medical centres have reported a severe rise in admissions already. Linda Nordling is a science writer in South Africa. What has been, as far as we know, the impact of this new variant, Linda? where did it come from? Good morning, thank you. Um, it's very difficult to say, it's quite early Nigeria, on. What the from? scientists have seen down here is that this new variant is increasingly replacing um, the uh, older variants, and which would indicate that it is easier, it passes more easily between people, so it might be more transmissible. Um, it, there is anecdotal evidence um, and reports from doctors that it's also less predictable um, in terms of who gets very sick, but that is far too early to say. In terms of the lessons learned, and, and there were many sort of bright spots in the response of the South Africans and the South African government, in terms of learning lessons from uh, sort of wave one, this second wave, particularly the new variant, um, what is, what's the government, what do the authorities say they're going to do? Well, it's... From down here, you know, it's night and day the way that the government has responded to the second wave compared to the first wave. The first wave um, was very uh, strong action straight away, um, harsh lockdowns. Some criticised the, 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 the harshness of the lockdown, but this time around there has been remarkably um, little action. And I think it's part of the reason is that the, the, the resurgence was unexpected. Um, they, the, the, the modelers did not expect the virus to, 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 to come back as quickly and as uh, strongly as it had. Uh, as it has, um, but also I think that the timing of this resurgence is very problematic for, for a country that is economically on its knees. And um, this is the holiday season when many South Africans Thank are you. making um, money from tourism and domestic Nigeria, tourism this year Florida, has been a kind of lifeline Florida, for um, this, holiday this uh, tours and destinations that normally yeah. depend on international tourists. And to shut down at that time nationally was a very oh, difficult man. decision for the government to take, and obviously they didn't take it this and time. I presume all eyes are now on the president, on the authorities, to see if they will announce any new restrictions. What, what are the likelihood of that? Any, any idea? I think it's very likely. So the uh, presidency announced yesterday that it had um, recalled the Coronavirus Command Council, which is made up of, of, of a number of ministers and cabinet. They'd recalled them from their holidays and they had an, an initial meeting yesterday. Um, today, I understand they are consulting with the different regions because obviously any restrictions that you impose will have to be acceptable and um, you don't want to kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. You want to have restrictions that actually make sense and that do um, uh, have an effect at this late stage because 
um, I think we all <laughs> understand that um, the, the second wave has 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 progressed quite far already. It is uh, a little mm -hmm. bit too late to do some of the things uh, that were done in the first um, in the first wave, like closing closing borders, because this variant is everywhere, and I think the virus is everywhere, and we will be sitting tight now for the next three weeks and just um, uh, try to cope. Many, many thanks indeed, Linda Nordling, science writer in South Africa. The statistics uh, really are quite striking because it was only nine days ago that South Africa marked 900,000 uh, cases. And in just over a week, that has already gone up to over a million. Well, across the continent, so far more than two and a half million cases have been confirmed across Africa. The BBC senior Africa correspondent now, Anne Soy, takes a look at the continent's response so far and discovers, well... Not surprisingly, the pandemic is far from over. This is how Kenya enforced restrictions meant to slow down the spread of COVID-19. Tear gas, gunshots and mass arrests. The use of force was also witnessed in Uganda, Rwanda, South Africa, among others. Bustling cities went quiet under lockdown. Millions stayed at home as thousands of health workers went door to door to screen people for the virus in South Africa, Nigeria and Cameroon. Most countries seemed to get it right. Dr. Machisido Moeti is WHO's regional director for Africa. African governments took uh, and, and of course the, of all the discussion about their systems are weak, they're so vulnerable. They took very tough decisions early on and imposed very drastic measures. And I think the social and economic impact of these is something that's going to be quite profound. So it's at a high cost that this is coming. The poorest were hit hardest. Like the other day, uh, they said they were going to give people some money, or uh, some food. Complaints from some residents of Lagos in May who had been promised help by their government. They just came, write names and write numbers. More than a month now, we, we have not seen them till now. The COVID we have here is COVID hunger. There is no food to eat. In South Africa, the economy shrunk by over 50% in the second quarter. Yet, amid all the struggles, corruption did not stop. Here is President Cyril Ramaphosa addressing allegations of corruption against senior members of the ruling party. I have authorized the special investigating unit to probe any allegations relating to the misuse of COVID-19 funds across all spheres of the state. Like many other countries, they were forced to reopen the economy to save livelihoods. It's almost business as usual now in most cities across Africa, and the virus is spreading. Africa may have succeeded in slowing down the initial outbreak of COVID-19, but a second wave of infection and a new variant is cause for great concern. At least 10 countries have also held elections in 2020, with more to come. Campaign rallies have attracted huge crowds that largely ignored health measures. There are also fears it may take some time for African countries to get enough vaccines. The COVID-19 pandemic is far from over. BBC senior Africa correspondent Anne Soy with that report. President of Burkina Faso, uh, Roch Kabore, is uh, due to be sworn into office later today. It's going to be second term in power. Uh, in the background of the election was uh, Islamist and ethnic violence, which meant large parts of the country weren't able to vote. But the Electoral Commission has looked into opposition claims of fraud and says that Kabore is indeed the president. Uh, let's speak now to uh, journalist uh, Mumini Subiega. Uh, from the RTB radio television in Burkina Faso. Warm welcome uh, to the World Service. Um, first off, can you just remind us how many people were affected by the trouble? How many people couldn't vote? Well, good morning, um, everybody. Well, le le let's say that the election will happen in a very bad condition and uh, uh, about uh, 300 uh, thousand people were not able to vote because of... Uh, the security situation in 
Burkina, mostly at the northern and the, uh, the, eastern, the eastern region of the country. But it's been determined that that doesn't invalidate the election at all, so it goes ahead. What are we going to expect from President Kabore in his second term, do you think? Well, in his second term, the priorities of um, President Kabore will uh, be uh, the security issue, the security issue, because um, uh, at the uh, certain region of the country, the situation is uh, to be controlled. Kind of wave one. Uh, I think we can catch up with the situation in L.A., now Los Angeles, which seems to be um, uh, the center of the pandemic in the U.S. Anthony Fauci, the top government scientist in the U.S., has been warning that the worst of the pandemic may yet be to come. Newspapers in California are calling it a viral wildfire. Is that an exaggeration? I've been speaking to Dr. Robert Kim Farley, who is professor of epidemiology at UCLA, the Fielding School of Public Health in Los Angeles. I really think this is now a viral tsunami, if that kind of gives you a visual mink, understanding the magnitude mink, that I see the situation positive. being. If you think matches being thrown into a, a forest, you know, occasionally you see a little bit of flare up like COVID disease, but now we really are facing a viral a raging wildfire here in California and LA. And That's when we think of the, kind of the first is. spike or the first wave, okay. to use that analogy, we think of New York and the hospitals under enormous pressure. Is that what we should be comparing it to now? Yes, really. LA is having its New York moment at the moment. <laughs> and so we are seeing that high, steep rise that has compromised our hospital systems. We really have no ICU beds capacity. So what's happening is that you know, elective surgeries are being stopped. People maybe are being discharged from an ICU earlier than they might normally have been. Patients are laying down in emergency departments, waiting for ICU beds. Ambulances that are sometimes having to wait hours to offload. Their so the patients. ICUs are in effect full, you seem to be saying. Yes, exactly right. And unfortunately, because usually you talk about mutual aid, you know, if your hospital doesn't have a bed, you send them to somewhere else. But in this situation where everyone around us in Los Angeles and surrounding counties are experiencing the same levels, there is no excess capacity. Is there no advantage, Robert, in what we've learned or what you guys have learned since the first way that, you know, the, the fact that people don't have to be intubated and put on machines to the same degree as before. We've learned other workarounds and so on. It seems that what you're describing is you're suffering a crisis of that degree, even bearing in mind the fact that now you can be more efficient in your treatment. Oh, Lawrence, you're correct in the sense that we do have better treatments, knowing proning, for example, for rather than necessarily having to go to intubation and, and ventilators at the beginning, you know, having uh, Regeneron and uh, dexamethasone and some other treatments on hand. But the problem is is sheer magnitude of numbers that, you know, the numbers of cases are leading then to higher numbers of hospitalizations. And, and, and what is driving that simply? I mean, this, there were dire predictions, weren't there, when people were allowed to mix around Thanksgiving. Is that a simple line between cause and effect? Well, I think what happens is is that uh, we have what I call amplifying events, you know, from these the holidays been back out to back, September. from uh, Halloween, going into Thanksgiving, going into Hanukkah and Christmas and now soon to be going into New Year's Eve. So what happens is that previously maybe only, you know, less than one in a thousand people had COVID. Well, now more than one in a hundred. So that means that the chances, whether you're at a store or whether you're visiting a friend, all of these things are so much higher to transmit the disease. Can people actually go out uh, and celebrate, uh, inverted commas, New Year's Eve? It, has that not been locked down and put off limits? Really, the thing is, it is a situation i think just say no when someone asks you to a party just say no if someone asks you to come over to their house for dinner just say no so that hospitals when you need an icu bed aren't telling you no that's professor robert kim farley of ucla's fielding school of public health Newsday BBC World Service. Lawrence Pollard, Claire McDonald, thanks for joining us uh, this morning. We're going to end on an annual tradition, uh, but it might <laughs> this might be the most fitting year for it. It temporarily barred all flights from the United Kingdom until mid-January. It's imposed a 14-day quarantine on travellers who have come from places where the new variant has been detected, including Hong Kong and Australia. 
President Rodrigo Duterte has also canceled face-to-face -face instruction in public schools until February. We have to know the nature of the germ, he says. Singapore, the first in Asia to receive the Pfizer vaccine, is also restricting travelers who have recently been to the UK. Julie McCarthy, NPR News. You're listening to NPR News. A Chinese court today sentenced a journalist of four years in prison for her reporting on the coronavirus outbreak in the central city of Wuhan. Her lawyer says Zhang Zan had been convicted of picking quarrels and provoking trouble. Her reports conflicted with official government accounts of the pandemic. EU countries started vaccinating their citizens this weekend. <coughs> NPR's Eleanor Beardsley reports from Paris. European Commission head Ursula von der Leyen said the EU has secured enough doses for its 450 million citizens. People will start taking the vaccine in Athens, in Rome, in Helsinki, in Sofia, you just name it. Our European vaccination days are a touching moment of unity and a European success story. Von der Leyen urged Europeans to continue to take precautions until enough people can be vaccinated. In France, where the anti-vaxxer movement is substantial, the French government is being cautious to ensure it's not seen as forcing vaccinations on the public. France was one of the few nations not to televise its first vaccination. Eleanor Beardsley, Pierre News, Paris. Sydney, Australia is one of the first major cities in the world to welcome in the new year. It features a fireworks display at the Sydney Harbour Bridge near the famed Opera House. Usually a million people attend the event, but this year authorities are banning large gatherings because of the coronavirus pandemic. Sydney saw a resurgence in COVID-19 cases recently. I'm Nora Rahm, NPR News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Merrill. Merrill Edge self-directed... Sweet started. Succession of each other and then secondary on fire.
So, had an epiphany last night. I was wondering why this phone hadn't been turned in for like a month or more. I see why I'm gonna use it for my recording. Let me see if I can switch over the Easy recording app over to here through Bluetooth since I don't have any cell signal here. And use it for my recording. Documentation says a 48 megapixel disk and one unit 16. Alright. That way I can listen to my music and record and I have no issues without the mess with my audio that I'm listening to you. And you guys will be able to see better. And it has 128 gigs inside of it. This one, I ain't got no space. Starting air up this morning. Go up front. Get the blackberries and everything out of the way. And do this driveway up here. And do a driveway loop around. Powered up it. In reverse. Forward wing got too much power. Only on three cylinders. Gotta go down this hill. Blackberries I cleared out before. But the not it. I made it. I made it, baby. Doing it. You ready now? Oh, you're on this side. What do you see? Starting off from zero. Do you think it's wise? Play back all this time in your head and. No, I'm grateful for all the experience. Yeah, I know. Because I wouldn't have got up that hill. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I said after going up this thing. So you no. no. Not sure. All I know is this thing and whatever gear I got it in right now in reverse, we got up the hill. So, get to cleaning this out and the blackberries and all that and pushing and making a road. It didn't take you that long, what, like an hour? <laughs> what? You have been all day. I know. I should have hooked the chain up and pulled myself up, but I wanted to see if it could get it up under power, even though it's on three cylinders. This I did all by hand. I'm gonna push all this out of the way now. And back up here. Do this tune up on this thing. That's the highest daily number since the pandemic began. Officials also confirmed 1,046 new infections. Since the pandemic started, the country has seen 858 deaths in total. Scientists have identified a network in the brain that appears to help uh, create conscious awareness. NPR's John Hamilton reports on a study just out in the Journal, journal of Neuroscience. A team led by researchers in Finland studied the brain activity of several dozen people as they went to sleep and woke up. Then the team repeated the experiment using an anesthetic in place of natural sleep. Both experiments caused changes in the same set of structures deep in the brain. These areas were deactivated when people lost awareness of their surroundings and then reactivated when awareness returned. The structures, including the thalamus, cingulate cortex, and angular gyri, are involved in functions like decision-making, thinking, and attention. The study's authors say that together, these areas appear to form a network in the brain that is essential for consciousness. John Hamilton, NPR News. President-elect Joe Biden says political leadership at two government agencies are hindering his transition team's access to important information. And that lack of access could cause massive damage, he says, to the country's national security. In remarks on Monday, Biden said the problem is occurring at the Defense Department and the Office of Management and Budget. He also said agencies critical to the nation's security have incurred enormous damage during the Trump administration.
Support for NPR comes from NPR Station. Other contributors include Rocket Mortgage, working to help home buyers find a home loan that fits their budget. Home buyers can adjust payments, see tax estimates, and closing costs. All the major cluster hotspots for coronavirus outbreaks. We have a report from the inside. All that plus the sport and the business that's news day. Let's start with President-elect Joe Biden. He has hit out at the Trump administration, saying he isn't getting the access he needs to crucial information ahead of the transition period. Uh, let's take a listen to what he's been saying. We have encountered roadblocks from the political leadership at the Department of Defense and the Office of Management and Budget. Right now, we just aren't getting all the information that we need from the outgoing administration in key national security areas. It's nothing short, in my view, of irresponsibility. Well, I've been talking to Lisa Hagan about this. She is the political um, reporter for U.S. News covering U.S. Congress. It's not entirely surprising given that President Donald Trump is still unwilling to acknowledge that he, in fact, lost the presidency. And it's kind of, you know, we're hearing these conflicting messages of who's actually sharing the right information, if enough is being given to the Biden team. So a little bit of friction just about three weeks out from a change in power over here. So what is he talking about specifically? What are the areas of concern? I mean, he seems to be saying lots of deployments, lots of agencies have been hollowed out. He clearly wants to rebuild those. But when it comes to international security, what do they need to know that they're not being told? He's been highlighting over the past few weeks the massive cyber attack that hit the U.S. And so it hit U.S. businesses, it hit agencies, it hit the Treasury Department. And so I can't say for sure if he's not getting those full briefings on that, but this is of obvious national security concern concern to him. So whether or not he's getting full briefings on that, the right information, any documents, that's top of mind for him right now, given that they still are and trying to figure out what exactly happened in his Russia. And when he says his team need a clear picture of our false posture around the world and that U.S. adversaries could exploit any confusion that resulted, I mean, that seems pretty basic, doesn't it? You know, to have that information, to know who is where, what their strength is. Is that pretty unprecedented in your experience? I would say so. It's typical that when someone loses the presidency, this period of time is called a lame duck, basically before the next president is installed and a new session of Congress is being seated. It's this period of time where it's a normal transition of power. It is what President Barack Obama did for now President Donald Trump, extending that courtesy to him, despite the two of them not having that great of a relationship. And so it's pretty odd to not be giving them the transition of power that every single outgoing president gives to their successor. And I think Biden made the point in terms of framing this from a global standpoint that he's arguing that U.S. allies and, and a lot of countries around the world don't respect the U.S. like they used to. And so for him, he is eager in his mind to get what he believes is back on track with the U.S. and its allies, and by not getting whatever information he is said to not be getting, puts him more at a disadvantage when he's about to take office on January 20th. Well, we are three weeks out from that, so what are the potential pitfalls? Could there be serious fallout from this? Do you think this is why he stepped in now and gone public, clearly with his frustration, the president elect Joe Biden? He's clearly concerned just in those three weeks. Yeah. Right, yeah. what do you call that vacuum of power right now? I mean, just not being able to have critical information, even what might seem small when it comes to being a national security risk, that is something that he would want to be able to have on day one. The U.S. just faced what seems to be a domestic attack, a Christmas Day bombing in Nashville, Tennessee. So I think the country's a little bit on the edge right now, and so wanting a full picture of where we are, both domestically and globally, is something that is chief and top in his mind right now. And so I think he just wants to go in on day one, having a full picture. Whether or not it actually does set us back in any kind of way is to be determined, but he at least wants to be fully prepared when he steps in on January 20th. 
Lisa Hagen there. She is a political a reporter for Congress for U.S. Mm, News. Trying to play with your little drones. This guy, Thanks very much for having me. Um, very closely, I'm following this very closely, not just as an Argentinian, but but a woman, um, as a as a human being. Uh, you know, in general, this is um, this is very big news for for everybody, I think. And uh, just explain. I mean, two years ago, it was rejected by the Senate. Uh, we've seen some countries obviously go down the route of taking uh, sort of national referendums on this. This is still going through uh, the sort of the parliamentary route instead. What do you think has changed in the past two years and more widely in the past decade or so in Argentinians' attitudes towards abortion? Um, well, I think um, a lot has changed in the society in terms of uh, how the, the debate, the questions has seeped into um, into in, into into everybody's um, mind, uh, you know, in, in terms of um, how important it is to to for the state to protect women and girls uh, in terms of not not just their individual rights, reproductive rights, but also in terms of the, their their general need for um, you know health health care and health health protection. I think, as you said in your introduction, it's very important to. To bear in mind and to remind the listeners um, that this is not just about um, an individual choice um, as a woman about what what you'd like to do with your with your own body and whether you want to uh, pursue motherhood or not. This is uh, more importantly, I think, and what's this is what is at stake. Uh, it's about the need to stop criminalizing uh, women and girls uh, who not just have an abortion or opt to have an abortion, but sometimes have a miscarriage, you know, just you know, women are being sent to prison for having a miscarriage. That actually seems, I mean, just outrageous. I think anyone would accept that. I mean, does that, is that the sort of thing that grabs popular attention? Because often the arguments around this, you know, they, they can be conceptual, but also there's often individual cases, um, uh, anonymous or otherwise, which really cut through. Can you think of ones in the Argentinian experience that have done that? Absolutely, yes. Uh, of course, um, there, there, are, there are many. Um, within those many, these are only a few that, you know, that end up catching the, the, the national and international uh, press and also the attention of international organizations such as Amnesty and the UN. Uh, but not so long ago, in fact, um, in 2017, um, um, there was a, a, a case that caught a lot of attention of a girl, of, of a woman in her 20s um, that named herself Belen to protect her identity. And um, she was from the northern province of Tucumán, uh, which tends to be more conservative, um, you know, as opposed to somewhere like the, the, the city, Buenos Aires. And she just uh, was suffering very strong abdominal pains, mm -hmm. took herself to the public hospital. Um, she was unaware that she was pregnant. She found out that she was pregnant there and then, uh, had a miscarriage. And while all this was happening, someone within the hospital reported her to the authorities. And she was... Um, 
very quickly sentenced to eight years imprisonment for aggravated um, murder. Um, so that's how, that's how shocking it well, could be. Well, I mean, that, that, that's the kind of story that would change anyone's mind. I mean, one interesting thing is that Christina F uh, de, de Kirchner, who was uh, president uh, not that long ago, she was actually um, against legalising abortion, but now she's changed her mind. Do, do you think that there is a big enough political change to actually swing the Senate vote? Because many people are saying it's going to be very, very tight. Yes, well, it was tight um, it, the, in, in the lower house um, a few a few weeks ago, but it, it was passed. And now um, um, the feeling is that uh, it's going to be tight, but the, there's because um, Alberto Fernandez, the current president, is backing uh, the bill that there will be, that there's a positive feeling that the, the, the bill will come through, but it will be tight, it will be very tense, we will have to wait till probably the wee hours of tomorrow morning till we know the results. But if it's not today, you know, if it's not tonight, it's, it's just a matter of time. It's coming, you reckon? No, it's, okay. Absolutely. Carolina, no, no. many, many thanks indeed. Carolina Orlov, uh, as you heard, watching very closely that vote in the Argentinian Senate in a few hours' time uh, on uh, moves to legalise abortion. Thank you to Carolina. Newsday BBC World Service headlines today. The House of Representatives has voted to reject Donald Trump's veto of a defence bill, raising the possibility that the president could, for the first time, see his power was limited in the final weeks of his term. The Bangladeshi Navy is transporting another 1,800 refugees to a flood-prone island in the Bay of Bengal. And the British military is being sent into English schools to help test pupils for coronavirus. James Gregg is here with the sport. Yes, COVID outbreaks causing real problems in the Premier League. Manchester City's Premier League match at Everton last night was postponed four hours before kickoff because of an outbreak of coronavirus around the training ground and at the club Everton said that they would be requesting full disclosure of the information City provided to the Premier League that led to that postponement. When are they going to get all those mismatches played? Elsewhere, Chelsea meanwhile dropped more points last night. Four points from five matches. Campaign group, the Marshall Project show more than 1,700 prisoners have died of COVID-19 and one in five has tested positive for the virus. The BBC has been given access to telephone recordings with female inmates who are currently incarcerated at a women's prison in Michigan. Gabriella Pomeroy reports. In the beginning of COVID-19, I thought that this was something that wouldn't reach us. I thought that I was fairly safe in prison. When the first coronavirus case came to the Women's Huron Valley Prison, inmate Tamara Washington wasn't too worried. And then it hit us. And once it hit us, it became real. Uh, a couple friends got really sick. We had a couple deaths here. And the fear and the reality of it all was just a lot. It was a lot of despair. Tamara's talking there to a phone helpline, which is run by the American Friends Service Committee, Michigan, and helps people inside navigate the prison system. Since March, the phone line has been inundated with calls from inmates fearful of the coronavirus ripping through their facilities. One of the first deaths at Huron Valley was Sue Farrell, in prison for murdering her husband after years of domestic abuse. My bunkie Sue Farrell, she was 73 years old. Um, she didn't have no symptoms until the day she passed. That's Chelsea Roundhouse, who called the prison wardens for help as her cellmate Sue was gasping for breath. She went to the desk and told the desk that she was having a sore throat, that she wasn't feeling well. Um, they told her to go lie down, that they were going to call health care. 9.05 passed by. I looked into my room, and it appeared as my bunkie was having a stroke. Her arms were in the air, and she was pale white, and it looked like she was, like, trying to scream, but she was just making, like, mumbling noises. Health care came to her with an oxygen tank, and by then she had already passed. You know, I watched her take her last breath, and I seen her carry her body away. Three days after Chelsea's cellmate died of coronavirus, Chelsea was moved into a prison unit with dozens of other inmates who quickly complained that she might infect them and had her removed. There are nearly 2,000 women at Huron Valley Prison, but campaigners say it's overcrowded. We ended up catching it because 
we don't have that social distancing space. We have 16 man cells, 10 man cells, we have four man cells, and it's just not possible when they're in rooms that are built like a closet. Risa McIntosh is serving a minimum five-year sentence, and she caught coronavirus earlier this year. I was very scared when I was told that I was positive. I felt like I was going to die. I couldn't breathe. My chest was caving in. I had a temperature of 102.5. My heart rate was 135. Nobody really wants to have any contact with us. And it's just like they treated us like we were dogs. The prison was running out of spaces to quarantine people. So they transferred the positive cases to a disused warehouse on the prison grounds. My name is Jakara Moore, and I'm serving an eight-year sentence at Woman here on Valley Correctional Facility. There was about like 20, 30 beds back there, and they was just filling them up, filling them up. Then it would get so hot in there to the point that people couldn't breathe. We didn't have no window to open or anything like that. So um, we had to beg to get like juice and fruit like that, and we had to fight tooth and nail just to get a Tylenol. off. We have put these testimonies to the Michigan Department of Corrections, which runs the facility. A spokesman says it is not overcrowded, medical staff were available, and that the women got fruit and juice with their meals, but their request for extra was denied. For inmates like Tamara, coping with life behind bars has become even harder as the routine of prison life has changed. For the most part, I stay in my cell. We no longer get visits. Our phone calls are minimized. The gym was my thing. It was like my favorite thing to do in prison. The gym is shut down. And it's like there's no relief. There's no outlet. Everybody was hurting and everybody dealing with things on their own. And so I try to find happiness in religion, seeking that out, getting closer to my higher power. It's like trying to get readjusted to this new normal of nothing. It's a lot of nothing, so it's more sleep. It's a lot of isolation. And it's like that's all I really have now, sleep and isolation. Tamara Washington then, a woman currently serving 10 years in a Michigan prison on how COVID-19 has changed life for prisoners on the inside there. That report from Gabriella Pomeroy. Uh, we have to tell you, a prison spokesman said the temperature in the quarantine building was appropriate for the current climate and that the inmates in quarantine had a TV and games and more to occupy them than the general prison population. Um, so that's uh, what they are saying on that. Uh, we're asking uh, you today, what have you been doing during lockdown? Because we're going to hear an incredible story in the next hour, Lawrence. Uh, a young boy called Max Woozy. He was inspired by his elderly neighbour, Rick. He's here in the UK. Uh, and this neighbour, Rick, gave him a tent shortly before he died. He gave him a tent and he said to this young boy, promise me you'll have an adventure <laughs> with it. And so from that moment on, as soon as the pandemic hit, he has camped in his back garden every single night. We've had a major storm in the UK just a couple of days ago, Storm Bella. He's been out there the whole time raising money for the hospice. Um, his neighbour went into and his neighbour's wife went into there. as well. He's raised uh, around 100 thousand pounds which is incredible 135,000 US dollars that's what he's been doing in lockdown <laughs> delighted to say we're going to be speaking to Max on Newsday in the next hour so stay with us Lawrence and Claire with you news is next distribution of the BBC World Service in the United States do you never want to sleep with me ever do you never want me to spend the night there in her room. She said I talked to her and I get her out. I'll, I was so fearful that people fall asleep on me. Yeah, you can know. I had like this. I don't know what it was. All that, you know, we had like a garage and I would climb on the garage and make like a laboratory in there until one time I got burnt really bad. 
because there was all that reflective fucking metal on the roof. And it was a sunny, hot ass day, and I spent all the day there. Didn't realize that I was getting burnt. Mm. You know, and nobody climbed up there to see what the fuck what I was doing. Yeah, I would collect flowers and put them in alcohol and make perfumes and always wanting to do shit. But then, like for example, I would like my signature was. Tell my mom that I was going to go spend the night at my friend's house, but then I would call in the middle of the night and I would tell my mom to come pick me up. Because what would happen was, the family that I was at, they would all start going to sleep, you know? And I was left there. It would be like midnight, 1, 1.30, and I already went to sleep. And I'm like, I'm going to go home now. You know, I couldn't mm -hmm. sleep there. And so I would call my mom and she would come pick me up. And she hated me for that. I would do it so often. Yeah. One time she broke her leg. Your mom? Coming to pick me up. Because she said it was dark. Your mom she, broke her leg? Yeah, she got out of bed. And she just rolled through the stairs, trying to come down and fucking get me. Okay. Yeah, I mean, she's still talking now. <laughs> yeah, she says, she all, like, that was my nickname, Annie's butt. Like, that's it, the only way I can translate it to you. Like, the butt that always got removed, you know? Yeah. But, it, it, and in butt, you say culo. Culo inquieto. Like inquietude, oh, that's Annie's. But for inquietude, for you, is like question, right? Like a question, like a wonder. Oh, yeah, is it young? I was on like the young sister you wanted. <laughs> you guys end up in the hospital? Huh? I said you guys spend the night at the hospital? And your mom broke her leg today? No, I didn't figure it out. I guess she went. She never came pick me up or something. I don't know. I was younger. I don't have the memory that you have any. But it's like, oh yeah. We did this and we did that. I'm just saying, I mean, you know. She probably might have come get me and then the next day she was like, oh shit. It's over. You can ask her if she'll send me yet. It's crazy because in Argentina people stay up pretty late, you know? Like, if you go to somebody's house, like, they will have dinner and then, like, the parents would stay up, you know, to midnight, maybe watching TV or something. Or, you know, because we don't have dinner till like, 9.30, 9. So, I'm, so by the time, like, you know, you pick up the table and, yeah. I was like midnight, and so I would call my mom like at one thirty or something. Like, come get me. I would have died by the third time. I would be like, no, you don't get this shit alone. <laughs> no, you stay here. I'm gonna ask my mom, like, I think what drove you to fucking keep. Giving me the chat because it wasn't once, is he could like before. I think after you broke your leg, you'd be like, All right, dude. Yeah, I know this woman can tell you. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not making it up like this was a thing. Like, okay. as a thing, as I couldn't sleep, this was a thing. Like, my I little ass is staying here, or you're staying there. I ain't coming. Claudia to you. was known for that with my friend's parents, you know. Yeah. And my parents 
weren't weren't my especially my dad he wasn't the kind of guy that would stay up late you know so i'm like calling my own house because at the time nobody had cell phones i'm calling my own house you know at two in the morning one thirty in the morning my dad's sleeping already i'm like I don't know if I would like. And your friends didn't say nothing in the next day or the next time I see you. Like, why'd you leave? I don't know. I would make shit up. Maybe like my belly hurts or I just want to go home. I got, I gotta ask my mom. Like, what did I say? You know, what did I tell? What did I tell Sully? Like, I want to go home. Like, for Sully's mom. You know, because at that time you did with your parents too. Well, I was like, yeah, you're just standing around my house. You're annoying. And I would do it over and over and over again. I gotta ask my mom. Well, I got serious issues. Yeah, but I would come in my own backyard. I would come in my own room. I did have a little tent and I was stuffed with teddy bears and <laughs> lions and shit that I had. And then I would sleep with them in the tent inside my room. You know, it was a little tent <laughs> for like like a one man tent like the one you had. Imagine that with bears and stuff. Because, you know, when I was young as a kid, oh, my, my bedroom felt big. Like, my bedroom was a big bedroom. Nothing crazy. It didn't have, like, I don't know, walk-in closet or bathroom or nothing. It was just a bedroom. But mm. the, the roof was tall. It was like this. You know? That you could make it a lot. It was a tall roof. And it was wood. Tall roof. And so it always felt really big, and nobody wanted to hang out with me there. I mean, like my family. Everybody was in their own room. And I'm like, alright. Let me, let me have a TV. I never had a TV in my room. I really want, like, the same stories of Fujirama and other stuff, and they would watch, like, TV shows and. I never really, I never was that big into it. I was always trying to figure out how I could make other people lose sleep using your free life. Kind of thing, you know. <coughs> like, <coughs> in the nose. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I think my mom would agree with that. Huh? I was most of the time trying to figure out how to make other people lose sleep. Huh? Keep them up. You know? Because yeah. then I would be less worried. So they would fall asleep and I'll be alone and awake. Now I don't care. You can fall asleep and I'll be just staring at it there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was like a past life thing.
as well, as we're about to hear, because local Lebanese families have been offering refugees space in their homes. Let's get more from Khaled uh, Kabara, spokesperson for the UN Refugee Agency in northern Lebanon. Welcome to the programme. Let's just start off with the fire. There's been tension between refugees and the locals. Is that what started it? Uh, good morning, Claire, and thank you for having us. Uh, indeed, uh, there was a personal dispute, basically, between some Lebanese and Syrian refugees that quickly escalated into a fire in one of the informal settlements in Minye in northern Lebanon, which have resulted in a fire that burned the whole settlement to the ground, uh, displacing around 100 individuals. We're talking about 90 refugee families losing their homes for the second time. What you say informal, so this isn't a formal camp. Why is that? I mean, 400 is a lot of people. So in Lebanon, there are no formal camps with a no encampment policy. So we have what we call as informal settlements. These are similar to camps in terms of structure. However, these are built by refugees themselves on private lands. In Lebanon, with the no-encampment policies, refugees live in cities, in villages, in makeshift uh, settings and structures, uh, in, in temporary structures as well. And that sounds like life is going to be pretty hard for them uh, in these conditions. You, you help them build these camps? What we, what we do is we provide them with the needed material in order for them to enhance these structures be it to withstand extreme weather conditions and to keep them safe and warm. Uh, in addition, we, we, we intervene in those sites by ensuring proper leveling, access to water, access to sanitation facilities, uh, some sort of uh, interventions that would ensure a dignified living condition for these refugees. But presumably, if these, this camp in particular was made of wood and, and plastic sheeting, it's one of the reasons it, it burnt to the ground so quickly. Quite, quite unfortunately true, yes. Mm. The upside to this, if there can be, these people are obviously in a perilous situation to begin with, is that once they lost everything, local families stepped in. Tell us more. Yes, it's quite remarkable, honestly, on the evening, uh, on the 26th of December, where, as the fire was happening, uh, we have seen a remarkable level of solidarity from the host community, as well as the relief agencies and authorities here in Lebanon. The host community were uh, kind of uh, uh, offering their vacant houses, vacant shelters, and sometimes vacant schools and hotels to host these families who were displaced and, and, and uh, in that evening. We know that this is the winter and winter is pretty harsh here and the temperatures can drop down to zero. And, and we actually count on the acts of solidarity of the host community for Syrian refugees because they're not only bearing the consequences of, of displacement, but they're also uh, uh, bearing with an additional layer this year, which, which is the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences on their challenges in general. So many refugees were hosted by neighbors, uh, Lebanese neighbors in nearby areas, also by extended family members. So no one was left outside that evening. Good to hear. Khaled, thank you for joining us. Khaled Kabara there, spokesperson for the UN Refugee Agency in northern Lebanon. Now let's talk uh, about another angle on Brexit. There is a well-established international student study exchange uh, programme across European universities within the EU called the Erasmus programme. Now Brexit is removing those opportunities for British students. A replacement has been announced but there's not a lot of uh, details as yet. What does this mean uh, for students? Let's speak now to Paul James Cardwell who's Professor of Law at the University of Strathclyde in Scotland who's been looking into this in detail. Uh, Prof, welcome to the programme. Prime Minister Johnson says the cost uh, to the government has been millions every year. Is, is that right? Was it more used by continental students than Brits? Um, well, good morning. Uh, the Erasmus programme, as you quite rightly say, is focused and has traditionally been focused on um, university students being exchanged between European universities. Um, it was established in 1987, and so over this 30-year period, it has evolved to include lots more things as well, including vocational training placements, school exchanges, and so on. So the budget covers 
all of that, plus staff exchanges and so on as well. So if you look at the bare figures, it looks like quite a, a big thing. And also, um, UK students have traditionally been regarded as being less involved than European students coming to the UK. That has changed over time. The number of students from the UK uh, going out has uh, increased uh, and also uh, much more varied in terms of subject area beyond uh, languages and so on. So although it's rather, it is you know quite a large amount of money, this is indeed what it costs in order to support the students uh, and everybody else participating in the programme. And I wonder if it's going to be any cheaper with this replacement. Uh, it named the Turing scheme um, after the uh, famous computer uh, pioneer. But w what are the challenges in getting a replacement for Erasmus off the ground? Because, I mean, it strikes me this is inevitably a reciprocal agreement. It's kind of like we take some of your students, you take some of ours. So... In an exchange programme, you need both sides to be interested in it. Will both sides be interested in making the Turing thing work? Um, that's exactly right, and that's the, that's, the, that's the key point. So the Turing scheme is designed to foster global level exchanges rather than only in, in Europe. But as you quite rightly said, it means individual contracts between universities, many of which already exist. I've negotiated them with universities um, outside Europe in, in the US and, and Australia, Hong Kong, and places like that. Um, the difficulty is, of course, that there are any number of administrative obstacles. Uh, contracts have to be agreed, which can take a very, very long time. Um, and also the key aspect of the these exchanges is that usually in order to work they work on a, on a fee waiver basis so some of the words coming out of the, the government um, at the moment are about students going to for example um, top level the US universities well it's very difficult to imagine how they will um, let in exchange students uh, without the tuition fees and the budget allocated to the new Turing scheme, I can't see, is going to be able to cover tuition fees as well as living expenses for also, students. Also, you, you well. sort of need an umbrella, don't you, uh, under which all this could happen, and that's what Erasmus used to do. It becomes, it seems to me, much more one-on-one -on -one and transactional, kind of like on a one-off basis if, you, if you're going to move towards the Turing model. Exactly. So the Erasmus scheme, because it's evolved over such a long period of time, it means that European universities all have um, agreement and, and on a common framework about things like credits. So when you send a student, you know what the expectation of how many credits they should be doing, how you treat that coming back, um, the funding mechanisms and the contracts work on basic standard terms. Once you start doing it bilaterally and not even on a country basis, but just on an institutional level, mm. then of course it's possible, but it takes a huge amount of resource and time and effort. Uh, who's going to lose out most, briefly? Well, my fear is that it will actually be the students who are less financially well off in the UK who've been able to take advantage of, uh, of the Erasmus uh, programme because it's not the grants allowed unto it to individual students uh, are not means tested. And although the stereotype is that it is better off uh, middle class students, actually this has changed uh, over time. And it's those students who might uh, lose out from a, uh, a programme which we haven't yet seen the full details of, but is going to be very difficult to get up and running uh, in only... Uh, a few months' time. Yeah, sorry to hear that. Many thanks indeed. Professor of Law at University of Strathclyde, Paul James Cardwell. This is Newsday, coming up to 12 minutes to the hour. Uh, Lawrence and Claire with you, and James Gregg with the sport. <laughs> the Health Minister, Salvador Ila, uh, said vaccinations won't be mandatory and the list of those uh, who refuse to be inoculated won't be made public. Now, so far, uh, polls seem to show about a third of all Spaniards are saying they won't take the vaccine, although obviously that may change. Let's speak about this now with a former MP and a member of the uh, Spanish Judiciary Council, Alphonse Lopez Tena. Uh, very warm welcome to the programme, Alphonse, once again. Uh, do, do you think this is a good idea? What do you think about it in principle? Uh, good morning, and thanks for calling me. Well, uh, that's the usual thing that, uh, that is always done. I mean, every year there is a wide campaign of vaccination of flu, and there is a register of the people that take the that take the the flu vaccine uh, because it's necessary to to be uh, to, to to do after the, afterwards what happens <coughs> if it works, etc. When you go to some countries when you are it's mandatory to get a, to get a vaccine like a yellow fever for instance, mm. you have a register of the people that are being vaccinated 
and those that, that haven't because they are, are not allowed to go into, uh, into that. Uh, that's quite interesting because what you're raising there is, is the argument, I suppose, that this is merely just a reversal or a kind of like, a, you know, the negative version, the black and white version of what people normally had. So if you need yellow fever, you have to prove that you've had the yellow fever vaccination. But in this case, what they're doing is they're proving that somebody hasn't had the coronavirus. So you're saying the principle is not that different. No, no, because there is a big difference in this case. The big, big, big difference is because it is offered, publicly offered to all the population. Uh, vaccines, in the, in the case of flu or the yellow fever or, or the other vaccine, is, uh, is not offered publicly to all the population. Right, that's it's not true a, as well. A public, yeah. It's not a, pl a public uh, pandemic. But, but what's interesting uh, is, 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 is as, as, as I understand it, the Spanish government are not making the vaccination mandatory. So therefore, no. why potentially punish people for not doing something that isn't against the law? Because if you do a list, uh, you have a list of all the population, because all the population is, is publicly closed mm. to get the vaccine. So if you have a list of all the population, because they are called that day, that place, uh, you have to go with that preparation, mm. all these kind of things. I mean, it's not an easy thing. It's not just to go there and get vaccinated. It's, 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 uh, it, it, we are talking about uh, tens of, of millions of people. So uh, when you have this list, you call somebody and that body doesn't present, you have in that list that that person has gotten the vaccine that day, that hour, and, and that other arm presents after that uh, a reaction, has problems, has fever or nothing at all, uh. as the, uh, and the immense majority of people, or this other person has not presented here. So we cannot, we cannot, uh, we, we, we haven't vaccinated him or her. But practic so practically it, speaking... It, the problem is if you have a list that everybody is called to be vaccinated, it's in a, a well, you will have a list of people who have and people who haven't. But uh, it would seem if you share that list with other European nations, mm -hmm. you can't just wash your hands of what the consequences will be mm -hmm. because they're very likely to try to ban travel on people who haven't vaccinated and therefore aren't, it's thought, virus safe. So you, isn't, isn't the government actually making some of a sort of imposing a, a negative uh, and, and a problematic um, uh, sort of imposition on some of its people. Yeah, but you, you may think that uh, to share it with other European countries or inside the World Health Organization, maybe uh, in the future, is a decision of, the, of all these countries if they accept of the established system or not. To, to to have this information. Yes, it's still it's very interesting uh, as a kind of like a legal principle. Thank you so much uh, for talking uh, uh, with us about it. Alfonso Lopez Tenia, uh, former MP, member of the Spanish Judiciary Council, uh, reflecting on that uh, decision by the Health Ministry in Spain to set up a registry of people who refuse to be vaccinated against coronavirus and share it with other countries. Newsday BBC World Service. Let's get your sports headlines now. Here's James. Covid outbreaks causing real problems in the Premier League. Government says they're now in isolation. The media watchdog Reporters Without Borders says that 50 journalists were killed in connection with their work in 2020. Most were in countries not at war. Journalists are increasingly targeted over investigations into corruption, organised crime or environmental issues. Prince Charles has told the BBC he now sees the private sector as a critical part of the solution to climate change and what he called the real emergency the world now faced. Prince Charles said people once thought he was completely dotty when he raised environmental issues, but times had changed. Tributes have been paid to the renowned Mexican singer-songwriter Armando Manzanero, who died on Monday at the age of 85. The Mexican president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, hailed him as a great composer. BBC News. Thank you for the latest news update. Hello, welcome. You're listening to Newsday on the BBC. New contagious South African variant of the coronavirus, which seems to be driving a sharp rise in infections. Uh, President Ramaphosa made an emotional speech in which he said the rapid rise pointed to an extreme lack of vigilance over the festive period. He said all bars, restaurants and shops are going to close. That ban on the sale of alcohol is going to return and fines for not wearing a mask. He was warning that if uh, uh, South Africans don't observe the measures, it's going to be a disaster for everyone. We are at an extremely dangerous point in our fight against the pandemic. 
unless we act now and unless we act decisively and thousands more people will lose their lives the stark reality is that every single district in this country has the potential to become a hot spot unless we observe the current preventative measures. Well, we've been discussing the new threat uh, with Dr. Richard Lascelles, who's an infectious diseases specialist at the University of KwaZulu-Natal and who helped identify this South African variant of COVID-19. A lot of the pressure was actually coming from frontline clinicians in, in the last uh, week or so because the health services, both public and private, have, have come under increasing strain. And um, just the rapid rise in cases over the past couple of weeks has, has really stretched services in, in many of the uh, parts of the country. And, and we heard the president there talking, particularly pointing out the, the, the effects of lack of vigilance, as he calls it, over the festive period. In terms of the new restrictions being brought in, can change of social habit be enough? What can, if, if everyone sticks to these new rules, what could be achieved? Well, I think we hope that that, that will give us significant slowing of the transmission. I, I, I think one of the challenges has been, uh, like everywhere, the kind of consistency and the co coherence of the message. So, so for a long time, there's been trying to get individuals to take personal responsibility. But that's been in the context of pretty light restrictions. And I, and I think after last night's address and, and these new restrictions, I don't think anyone can be in any doubt as to the the seriousness of the situation and, and, and the need for us all to take personal responsibility and, and to do what we each can do to, to prevent the spread of, of the virus. Are we seeing one of these situations where the new variant is basically responsible for all new infections? I mean, is it, is it replacing the previously circulating variants? How dominant is it now? Yeah, that, that is essentially what we're seeing in the areas where there's a lot of transmission. We've seen it rapidly become the, the dominant um, variant or lineage circulating. So, so in parts of Eastern Cape and Western Cape, it's, it's now essentially almost 100% of the samples that we are sequencing in, in our genomic sequencing and in KwaZulu Natal it's it's uh, about two-thirds of, of the sequences so um, it is rapidly becoming the the predominant circulating variant that's uh, Dr Richard Lascelles one of those at the University of KwaZulu Natal who first uh, managed to identify this new South African variant of COVID <laughs> World Service. Let's turn now to reactions to the sentence handed down to one of Saudi Arabia's best-known women's rights activists. Today, China first sounded the alarm about the coronavirus. Ryan said as deadly as the pandemic has proved, quote, this is not necessarily the big one that scientists have long predicted as humans encroach ever deeper into the habitats of animals. The space virus program, that's the new one. Ryan. Coming. If there's one thing we need to take from this pandemic with all of the tragedy and loss is that we need to get our act together. We need to get ready for something that may even be more severe in future. This pandemic, he said, is a wake-up call. Nareet Eisenman, NPR News. California Governor Gavin Newsom is warning of a possible new surge in coronavirus cases in his state following heavy holiday travel. California has been struggling with record case counts, hospitalizations, and deaths. Stocks closed up on Wall Street Monday, buoyed by passage of a coronavirus stimulus measure. The S&P 500 was up... What is that? There's a news article from ABC News. This is saying what I've been saying. The shit ain't gonna work. The mink variant blocks it. And you got the South Africa variant, and you have the Nigerian variant that they still ain't figured out yet. We're talking on. It's never going to work. So nurse says positive after getting the vaccine Actually, shot. It's a message that resonates. 2016, Donald Trump becomes president-elect Trump. Mm -hmm. Trump. You know VP882 is the only way of killing this stuff, folks. And the work that my wife and I do. But I got to get all this stuff together. 
I'll tell you what, I ain't been able to sleep because the plasma and the kids, the sentient beings have been showing me things and I gotta... There's things that I'm putting together. There's again the third variant which is out right now that hasn't accumulated enough mass for people to pay attention to is brewing in Nigeria. The mink variant is, came from UK and trying to figure out what is the animal that got infected and reinfected humans in South Africa and the same for Nigeria. Maria has been too busy so I haven't been able to pester her with the SE5 get Dallas I'm just going off my own information and I have no phones that are hooked up and I don't go into town so it's just the stuff that's shown to me that I speak on and we have our flirts where we argue with each other and then she hears on the news or gets shown something because she's hooked to the internet and I don't know what's in her head but she's probably like fuck dude this idiot's been talking about this and now it's here on the news and here we start talking I'm not saying we've been arguing or anything, but I'm just saying previously that having with the mink thing and other stuff. And hey, honey, I heard on the radio when I was going. And shit. <laughs> Wake up, people. This shit's gonna infect all the animals. Again, all ACE2 receptors. So the tiger has been infected by the asymptomatic human in January of this year infected four lions. From there, you have otters and minks, gerbils, dogs, cats, anything with ACE2 receptor. So far, what is infecting humans from being infected by us is a mink and an otter. There's been several occasions of cats and of dogs. Again, how is the 5YOB mutation same in the variant from South Africa, what did it stem from if the Denmark and Netherlands strain is from the mink farming? Now, three weeks ago, wild mink in Utah came up positive for coronavirus. Five weeks ago, Oregon mink farm came up positive for the same variant as the European Denmark strain from mink. Go figure. They keep trying to say it's holidays making this shit spread around, but this stuff is 70% more infectious. It swept through and people thought it was the flu at first. This is why South Korea and other places are having explosions more than they had when the very first strain hit. And not understanding or realizing. Come to your senses. Deep as the well and doth long does it take for it to realize what has fallen into its depths. If you listen to Keish talk, 305 to 319, the man admits that they made it and are forcing evolution of man to supposedly go out into space, along with breeding humans in China in those tubes and other things, and rush along with it. We got people. The quiche Kool Aid actually worked. You'd see it on the news. Iran would be cured. But you don't see any of that. We got people. We have the solar panels. Moving over there into the light. I need to get this thick clumping of trees out the way now. Let's see. These guys here. I can get to those that have been falling on the crystals.
uh, horrible, but I'm gonna put ringlets, have them on cable, or they articulate. Maybe I solar cells. The other one. Solar mood. Everything set up. Icebox AC and DC go down to minus five degrees Fahrenheit. Bit. Try to repair the tree fall in the house. Crazy. Yeah, adjust the solar other panel. I'm gonna knock down some more trees. Move them. If you would back out. Converter is leaking out more gas than it's going into the engine. I gotta fix that. Knock this whole rope. Right there now. In the thicket of things. It was nice with the backhoe. I was grabbing them, the chain, debranching them, stacking them. here coming with the backhoe and step this mountain down but we'll be coming down and cutting all this oak super thick make fire protection take this down come around the mountain top of green island fire protection green won't burn Vaccines don't work. Stuck in the other one. Gotta fix it. Getting closer. Stuff is so thick. Up to that patch and need it out. Use you guys carefully so don't fall. Over the hill. Bucking them down so that they get up. The way of each other, I've got to follow the lower ones and then follow the higher ones so that they can fall. Process. And you can come back up to the top. Still crushing and breaking trees down there. It sucks when it came loose. Snap. Crushing some puncture. Gas tank. Oh, Compression rings just came in from mine. Out the water. Similar to I can put this back together. Put the blade back on this one, the chain on this guy, 
do it moving. I'm wondering. 440 and a 40. Yeah, that's a little bit different. Sometimes. Go back to the first guy. Switch the blades over and continue going. Uh, big trees that I was cutting down there almost smushed me. Oh, this guy got messed up like that one just got punctured. Tin bite in up. Just cut some wood. I'm gonna grab a couple more Wilburos from up there. I cut from where I was cutting at of oak. I'm draining the chainsaw out of gas. Do the piston. Yeah, <coughs> 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 the piston runs in there. <coughs> 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 ICU capacity, and the world says goodbye to a beloved Gilligan's Island actor. Right now, though, we check traffic and weather together. We do it every 10 minutes. Let's start with Bob Williams. Our report brought Newsom is unveiling a plan to reopen California schools for in-person learning by early next spring. The proposal, calling for $2 billion in state funding to pay for additional expenses like COVID-19 testing and personal protective equipment. Now, this is our very... argument. This is our emphasis. UK, this yeah, is our, our strategy. Newsom says the plan calls animal. for a phased approach to reopening with a focus on safety and equity for all students. He says special needs and other vulnerable young students, as well as younger students from transitional kindergarten up to the sixth grade, will be brought back. A Republican senator says he's taking President Trump's claims of widespread voter fraud during the presidential election seriously. CBS News political consultant Leonard Steinhorn says that would force both the House and Senate to vote, which would delay but not likely alter the final certification of Joe Biden's win. New poll came out that a third of Americans, mostly Republicans, believe that voter fraud got Joe Biden elected, despite the fact that the courts, election officials, and the Justice Department have found no evidence of widespread spread fraud. So this effort to challenge the Electoral College is going nowhere, but it's a big show put on by the president's partisans to curry favor with him and his base. Some Republicans in the House have already said they'll object on Trump's behalf during the January 6th count of electoral votes. The California Department of Public Health is releasing the latest data on current ICU capacity by region, indicating the Sacramento region is doing well compared to two other areas. KFPK's Taylor Martin breaks down the numbers. The greater Sacramento region is above <coughs> the 15% minimum threshold at 17.4%, while the San Joaquin Valley and Southern California regions are at 0%. The Bay Area region is below the 15% minimum at 7.5%, while Northern California has nearly doubled the minimum capacity at 31.5 percent. The Greater Sacramento Region's stay-at-home order is set to expire on January 1st, where our region's four-week ICU projections will be calculated, and if we have capacity of greater than or equal to 15 percent, the order will be lifted and we will return to purple tier restrictions. Taylor Martin, News 93.1, KFBK. California's first manual snow survey of the year went better than expected. 30 and a half inches of snow depth and a snow water equivalent of 10 and a half inches were recorded at Phillips Station in El Dorado County. That's about 93% of average for this day. Overall, the Sierra is just at 52% of average because of an extremely dry fall. The Department of Water Resources' Sean de Guzman says January and February oh, are historically California's wettest Months. And it's not uncommon for the bulk of our Sierra snowpack to come from just a handful of winter storms. On average, the Sierra snowpack supplies about 30% of California's water needs. Now let's get you caught up on all this hour's top national stories on News 93.1 KFBK. A new battle in the war on COVID-19, a new and more easily transmissible variant of the virus has been detected in at least two states. San Diego County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher says a 32-year-old tested positive yesterday. Because there is no travel history, uh, we believe this is not an isolated case in San Diego County, uh, and there are probably other strains uh, other uh, cases of the same strain in San Diego County. The first case was a member of the Colorado National Guard who responded to an outbreak at a nursing home. Governor Andrew Cuomo says the variant is also likely in New York. The CDC now projecting there could be 424,000 deaths by January 23rd. California and Texas are among the states setting records today as cases, hospitalizations, and deaths continue to climb. In New York City today... 
the bells at St. Patrick's Cathedral sounding <coughs> in memory of the 335,000 lives lost to the pandemic this year. Daria Albinger, ABC News. And we told you that uh, Gilligan's Island cast member passed away today. Didn't want to forget about that. Dawn Wells has died as a result of the coronavirus. She passed away today at the age of 82. She, of course, was Mary Ann. And Wells isn't just known for Gilligan's Island. She was in more than 150 TV shows in addition to many films. Wells also competed in the 1959 <coughs> Miss America pageant as Miss Nevada. <coughs> just ahead on the KFBK Afternoon <coughs> News, we'll take a look at our poll. Question. Today, uh, we're getting a lot of response on this. We'd like to hear from you. Do you agree with Governor Newsom's phased plan to reopen California public schools. <laughs> Your choices are, yes, it's about time. Yes, but it needs work. No, it's still not safe. And no, it's a waste of money. We'd like to hear from you. Let's go to the KFBK Afternoon News with Kitty O'Neill page at KFBK.com or go to the Twitter page at KFBK. If you'd like to expound on the reason behind your vote, dial pound 250 on your smartphone and say open mic. Also straight ahead, traffic and weather together. In fact, we'll do those next on News 93.1 KFBK, live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. <laughs> the sounds from the year 20... Longer ...on the Apple App Store, and its TikTok account isn't active anymore either. The announcement was made on the app's Instagram account. The move comes during the holiday season, where hospitals are being overwhelmed with people treated for the coronavirus. Again, that pound 250 on your smartphone allows you to expound on your choice of the KFBK Afternoon News poll question options just up ahead on kfbk's afternoon news we'll check the top trending stories and go in depth on the uk variant of covid19 arriving in california what it means and how the state is handling the new mutation plus traffic and weather together on news 93.1 kfbk you may not have a radio at home but you have your smartphones smart speakers and you can listen to us live anywhere anytime on the iheart radio app or ask for us on alexa or google home just say Okay, what animal did it come I from? Boards in all of the counties within California. Hmm. The California State Sheriff's Association opposes the law, saying there are plenty of already uh, oversight processes that uh, if someone has a complaint about the police, they can come to. Taylor, thanks for that. It's 447 on News 93.1 KFBK and time to go in-depth on the novel coronavirus. The UK mutation has now arrived in the U.S. ABC's Alex Stone joining us now. Alex, we're hearing the variant's also been confirmed here in California. Absolutely, and the, the breaking news this afternoon is that he is now in California. Governor Newsom uh, making the announcement uh, not long ago that uh, Southern California now that there is a confirmed case and... You know, this seems like at this point, kind of what we saw early on in the pandemic, that once we knew about the variant, or, or in that case, the actual uh, virus, but now the variant, that it was already too late, that, that it would already spread to other areas. And the expectation is it is probably in many areas other than California and Colorado uh, in the U.S. and global. In so today in Colorado they've got one confirmed case one likely case handful of cases uh, that may be the variant but they have not confirmed yet uh, in the uh, Colorado cases uh, both of the confirmed and likely are National Guard members neither had traveled that indicates community spread that, uh, that you've got this uh, thing that if they didn't go to the UK they got it somehow here's uh, Colorado's governor Jared Polis first variant of COVID-19 uh, in the United States right here in Colorado. Now, to be clear, that doesn't mean that uh, Colorado is the first state that has people with a variant. In fact, it's very likely exists in many states, particularly states that have more interaction with the United Kingdom. Yeah, both those National Guard members in Colorado, they had been helping at an assisted living home, at a nursing home, but now the question is, where did they get it? And nobody really knows because, yes, everybody in that nursing home has pretty much had COVID, but they've been testing and they have not found the variant in that nursing home. They're still working on that. So these two National Guard members may have gotten it somewhere else. And then you wonder where else in the, the community is it. But we do now know that, uh, that the variant is in California. Alex, the Southern California region is continuing to take the brunt of the COVID-19 fatalities. What's it like there right now? It's, it's rough for hospitals here in Southern California. And you look at the new numbers today, 30,000, almost 31,000 new cases in California, 432 dead in the past 24 hours. Most of that is Southern California. Many hospitals are now overwhelmed moving in to crisis care. That's when care is rationed in that hospital and doctors have to decide 
we will give care to this person because they are more likely to survive. And there are tents set up outside of the hospitals. There are overflow areas. There are people getting treated in gift shops, in the cathedrals inside of hospitals, in the, the hallways. It is a, a rough situation in many Southern California hospitals right now. ABC's Alex Stone reporting from Los Angeles. We appreciate it. 4.50 now at News 93.1 KFBK. Time to check traffic and weather together. We do it every 10 minutes. We start with Bob Williams. And traffic brought to us by the California Labor and Workforce Development Agency. Heading over against this particular strain. The UK approves the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Hmm. British health official Dr. June Even Rain says one dose is around 70% effective well, before the second dose is given. The safety of the public always comes first. A U.S. military official tells CBS's David Martin there is intel indicating Iran is planning an attack against U.S. forces or interests. Mm -hmm. This one year after the killing of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. This officer said the intelligence of preparations for an attack is the most concerning he's seen since the immediate aftermath of Soleimani's killing. Republican Mitch McConnell says Congress has provided enough pandemic aid. He's blocked another attempt by Democrats to force a vote on bigger checks. I'm Jennifer Kuyper. Your top local story, many students in California haven't been in a classroom since March. Now, ABC's Alex Stone tells us the governor is laying out a plan to get kids back to school in the coming yeah, months. On a day when California is reporting kids. a record 432 more COVID-19 deaths in the past 24 hours, Governor Gavin Newsom is laying out a plan to get students back to in-person learning this spring. Newsom's plan includes $2 billion for safety gear and testing of students and staff on a weekly basis when case rates are high. Transmissions among and from younger students, students to students, is simply not common. Masks will be That's mandatory for staff and it students is. at all times. Alex Stone, ABC News, Los Angeles. Now let's get more news with KFBK's Taylor Martin. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is expressing her sadness about the death of a Louisiana congressman-to-be. Luke Bledlow from Louisiana, due to be sworn in this Sunday but taken by the coronavirus. Pelosi says it's heartbreaking that he was so young. It's so sad, 41 years old, coronavirus, blood clot complication could happen to anyone. Pelosi notes how many Americans like Loot Letlow have been killed by the coronavirus. It has happened to nearly 350,000 Americans. Many of those deaths could have been avoided. The California Democrat today is expending sympathies to the family of Luke Letlow and all those killed by the coronavirus. Coronavirus stimulus checks could be in the bank accounts of you today. KPK's Mark Mayfield has the details. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said direct deposits could start being deposited yesterday. Paper checks will begin being sent out today. The $600 payments are meant to help boost the economy amid the downturn caused by the pandemic. Meantime, the House voted on Monday to increase those payments to $2,000, but that move faces an uncertain future in the Senate. Mark Mayfield, News 93.1 KFBK. Today is the last day to sign up for health insurance if you want to be covered starting January 1st. Covered California says those wanting to sign up for a policy must sign up by midnight. Executive Director Peter Lee says there's more help than ever in paying for health insurance. California actually put new money on the table. There's state subsidies on top of federal subsidies, which means many middle-class Californians right here in the Sacramento area are getting state dollars to make health care more affordable. While the state's open enrollment will continue until January 31st, any policies started after today's deadline won't provide coverage until February 1st. Leaders of Covered California extended the enrollment period by 15 days due to the coronavirus pandemic. And pending home sales fell 2.6% last month, marking the third straight month the index has declined. The National Association of Realtors Chief Economic Lawrence Yun says the drop is due to rising home prices and lower inventory. The decline is largest in the western states, where we're seeing a 4.7% drop, the smallest decline in the south of 1.1%. This rainy season is off to a slow start, but as KFBK's Brody Fernandez tells us, all hope remains in 2021. January and February are California's most generous months when it comes to rainfall. Department of Water Resources spokesman Chris Orrock says the year 2019 was so generous that we're still living off its reserves. 
We're at about 30% of average uh, to date for our precipitation, but a really good note that came out of today is we held our first snow survey up at Phillips Station Snow Course, and we're at 93% of our January 1st average. Even though the state has a plentiful amount of snow, state water officials are still looking for that one big atmospheric river to come through and get us to where we need to be in terms of rainfall as well. Brody Fernandez, News 93.1 KFBK. It's 5.06 on the that. KFBK Afternoon News. Thanks, Taylor. Dawn Wells of Gilligan's Island fame has died from the novel coronavirus. She passed away today at the age of 82. She played Mary Ann on the show. And Wells isn't just known for Gilligan's Island. She was in more than 150 TV shows in in addition to many films, she yeah, also competed so in the 1959 Miss America pageant as Miss Nevada and was once a guest right. on the Pat Walsh show here on KFBK. I remember it well. She was one of the All nicest the ladies who ever so walked into our can. KFBK studios. In fact, I think Joey was here trying to get her to sign up right. to volunteer for the Special Olympics event that weekend, not understanding that uh, Marianne had to uh, go on to other business affairs. But Dawn Wells of Gilligan's Island fame, dead from COVID-19 today at the age of 82. Coming up at 5.11, we'll take a look at our KFBK poll question today. But right now, let's get you caught up on this hour's top... A case of likely more cases in California, and we likely will be seeing well, reports from the other states. State Colorado was the first to do that. The nation's wow, most populous state continues to be hit hard by the virus. Here in L.A. County now, the National Guard is on its way to begin helping the medical examiner's office deal with all of the bodies that have to be processed. L.A. County Health Director Dr. Barbara Ferrer. We have reached a terrible milestone of exceeding 10,000 deaths from COVID-19 in L.A. County. In L.A. County alone, 270 more reported dead in the past 24 hours. Statewide in California, 432 dead in the past day. Alex Stone, ABC News, Los Angeles. Government officials are admitting that Operation Warp Speed isn't exactly working at warp speed. The number of vaccinations hasn't been what they'd hoped for. I visualized as early as uh, 8 January, between 8 and 15 January, the expansion uh, to their utilization will greatly increase access of vaccine to the American people. That's Operation Warp Speed COO General Gustav Perna. Missouri Senator Josh Hawley says he'll object to the Electoral College results when Congress meets next week. I think he finds this a, a great way to fundraise. Uh, he knows this is a hopeless task, uh, but it's going to raise his profile, uh, makes him look like a fighter based on disinformation. And it's I find it, you know, the quintessential politician. It's, it's really um, a little slimy. That's Virginia Congressman and fellow GOP Denver Riggleman. The Girl Scouts is calling on all cookie bakers to stop using palm oil in their products. It's often produced using child labor. You're listening to ABC News. Part 10 at News 93.1 KFBK. We check traffic and weather together every 10 minutes. Let's start with Bob Williams. Hey, and traffic brought to us by Stockton. In the, US, in the UK, ABC's Alex Stone tells us it's now been found in Colorado. Both a confirmed case and a likely case of the COVID-19 variant in Colorado are National Guard members who had been offering support at an assisted living home. Work is underway now to figure out if the Guard members <laughs> got it in that facility or in their own lives. Colorado Governor Jerry Jared Polis saying while his state is the first to find the variant, it is probably elsewhere in the U.S. It's very likely it exists in it's many it's states, particularly order. states that have more interaction with the United Kingdom. Well, California is now trying to figure out if the new variant is causing its surge in cases around L.A. Alex Stone, EBC News. Small businesses are able to apply for a COVID-19 relief grant as of today. It is 2019 that he was making bombs in the RV at his residence. The report says police went to Warner's home and couldn't make contact with him, and that the RV was there, but in a fenced-off area. Chief John Drake being asked why nothing materialized from that warning. Officers had no legal basis to go into Warner's fenced-in yard at home. He says requests were also made to the FBI for any information about Warner, and Drake says everything came back negative. Mark Remillard, ABC News. California's first manual snow survey went better than expected. 30 and a half inches of snow depth and a snow water equivalent.